recording. <laughs> Amazing. Now you have your levels at least. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and we're back in the room. And <laughs> well, we're back. Yeah. Sorry to talk shop. <laughs> um, Alejandro, so much of the film kind of is based on your chemistry with Matt. Is that something that you were able to develop before filming or was that something that kind of had to naturally occur? Um, well, we had a little bit of practice uh, right about a week before to, uh, to get together and do like a little chemistry thing and we rehearsed some scenes. So uh, it was easy because Matt is such a giving actor in that respect and John especially uh, directing the moments. I never get this opportunity because that's a character actor. You only get one, yeah. two scenes. <laughs> to be able to develop this character and to work with these two gentlemen as such a giving director and, and actor. It, it, was, it was easy. It was easy for me. Nice. Yeah. Um, the initial meltdown scene, we'll call it, kind of informs so much the film, when you're as well as performing and writing it. Th that's such a double-edged sword because that scene then later on takes a kind of a different tour. And were you worried writing or performing at that? we wouldn't feel sorry for Sean, or you can kind of watch the scene and go, well, I can see why his boyfriend left him, and then you don't have sympathy for the character later on in the film. I Well, I don't think you can play all that as an actor. I think all you can play is what's going on with him in the moment, and, and it was important to us to really ground it in a sense of truth and, and to not worry about whether or not it was funny or not, but just to play the circumstances as is. We rehearsed it a bit. We had... We had some pretty interesting clips to draw from of, of newscasters breaking down over the years. And so uh, <laughs> I think we just went with that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and tried not to worry about how it would be perceived, but just to play the scene as is. Was that something as well when you were writing that you found that you, you didn't want this scene? Because it does, it takes on several different meanings then later on with the mm -hmm. not to give too much away. But if you don't come out of that scene, feeling for Matt's character. It's not for till much later you kind of find out the reason behind that was none of that playing in your mind when you were writing. Yeah, it's certainly a small target to hit, mm -hmm. I think, in terms of writing and performing, for sure. Uh, but as Matt rightly points out, if it's true, it's going to work. Um, but um, it was the first day of filming that we did. And it was first in a, scene I did. Yeah. First scene, first day, which is a big ask. And I do remember it was in a soundproof TV studio and it was just me and Cameron sound mm -hmm. in the room with Matt and then everybody else outside on monitors. And I remember after one of the takes, just I was struggling not to laugh because the performance has such great comedy in it and then opened the door to go out and get water and everybody outside was crying. So it makes you realize yeah, that it yeah, means different things to different people. It, precisely. And if it's true, it'll work regardless of the outcome. It's such a fun beat to start the film off on, too, because yeah. I think it immediately takes the audience outside of their comfort zone. Yeah. And they, they're going, well, it's, it's fun to have a palpable reaction where people aren't sure like should I laugh at this is this funny is this sad I don't and I think that was the intention of the script so yeah just yeah. to land in that moment is great isn't it yeah it was it was kind of I was when I read the initial synopsis I was waiting on a kind of a network scene you know the yeah. I was waiting on something like that it just completely took me uh, by surprise with that yeah I told you my Madonna story earlier. Um, <laughs> that song, is that when you're writing a scene like that, is the song come first or do you have the scene in mind and then you spend you know, hours trawling through iTunes or Spotify trying to find something that fits it? I remember uh, my previous film played at a film festival in New York and um, I had a great weekend over there with uh, Rob and Rebecca, the producers, and a couple of other friends. And then we shared a cab to the airport and um, Borderline by Madonna came on and we'd had a big rowdy weekend and we were flying <laughs> home and we'd had a boozy old lunch and we all were just singing in the car. And I remember thinking, this is a nice little moment that we're having here. So I guess it was in my head in some shape or form, just from experience. But uh, when the time came to write this script, I think uh, it's as much about what Madonna does in terms of binding the... A gay white American experience with the Latino experience. Not many artists cross over as fully as she does, mm -hmm. and uh, we're eternally grateful for it. <laughs> Thank you, Your Majesty. Yes. Because there's that wonderful scene in the, the stag as well when Andrew Scott's character sings Raglan Road. Yeah. And it reminds me of that scene, the way the song was kind of bringing people. It's on the surface, it just looks like it's just a, a, a nice moment between it. Well, there's that little undercurrent to it as well. Yeah, it's always nice to use music to illustrate plot and to push the story mm -hmm. forward. I think. Um, but it's weird to hear me say that because I don't love musicals. Uh, mm. But at the same time, within comedy drama films, you shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. it's funny. But like, I think as a 
as a, as a, as a way of moving a story forward within mm. a comedy drama, it's a great thing. And, and I can think of other films where the the moments where a song appears and it pushes the story along are always pleasing. And it's one of the ways we connected creatively. He sent yeah. me a playlist of songs, okay. kind of a poppy chulo playlist, and I just had it on repeat for months before we started. So there was something about the, the vibe of the songs and the yeah. artistry and, and that g gave me tonal references for working on the film. So that was the first time I've ever done it and I found it really effective. And also it's a lingua franca for the two guys, yeah. generally. Music and food and uh, the landscape of LA, mm -hmm. they're the points that the two guys are able to connect through. When you don't have a language in common, mm -hmm. things like music become much more important. Was there ever, I remember I spoke to you about two years ago and you were saying you were working on the script and they were they had a type of sign language they were using mm. between each other. Was there ever more communication between outside of that or was it you really wanted to capture the, the loneliness? I think I always meant by the sign language just that it was like pointing mm. and, uh, you know, the kind of gesturing that we do even when we yeah. don't speak English. Um, you can learn so much by just looking into somebody's eyes. Mm. You know, you, you can tell a story and you can read a story by just looking into somebody's eyes and that's... Uh, if you have that in mind as a director and then you're able to find two actors who are able to play that as well as these guys, then you're on the road to something good. So. And did you have a kind of a conscious decision of what you were able to pick up from Sean's character? Because you obviously speak English, you understand everything he's saying, but having to react to that in a very you know, a childlike way, essentially, did you pick certain aspects of Sean's, what his character was trying to say or what his character was trying to get across to you that you would pick up on? Um, I, I think in the portrayal of, of in the work process, uh, that's when I was figuring out, uh, or as an Ernesto, is what is this guy trying to tell me, or what's he talking about? At the first, the first moment when we're when we're on the, on the lake, uh, he's not really paying attention because he's just there for the money and the work. The second time and the third time that we we we, we go out is the building blocks of understanding where where this this. Uh, Character is, is really coming from, and then the realization was uh, the the last moment, where uh, his friends surround him, and then Ernesto realizes what he's really going through. Because uh, there's that the scene at the party where yeah. you're kind of it's escalating more and more that you're becoming the life and soul of it, and Sean is somewhat jealous, kind of looking over at, at Ernesto, kind of being able to to meld so quickly with other people, something that he can't do. Really, this, is that something that was on the page, or was that? Oh yeah, that was, yeah. I, I think that that's that's what what uh, John really wanted toward that moment. He looked over to me, and I was looking over to him. So it was kind of like a, a double yeah. a double entendre there, where where it's like, uh, who is who is is the story really about? Is 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 the, the Sean character, or is it Ernesto that's developing? Uh, uh, the friendship and the connection with these with with, yeah. with those two people uh, I realized like I said that in that moment I that's when I realized what he's really going through and yeah. and uh, uh, the experiences with the friends uh, which for me was family as yeah. a character was family yeah. he, didn't, he didn't have any no. family at all and that was his family yeah. And he's very envious of that relationship as well. No, I think I, he's I think actually really envious. happy that he's mm. blending in with his friends. Yeah. I think he's concerned about his, what, making sure he's okay right. in the circumstances. But I'm I sorry, envious that of Ernesto's uh, family life and that connection. No, there. I oh. think he loves it. I think it's, it's a boon to him. I think it's fascinating to him and beautiful for him. Mm -hmm. Alluring, not nothing to be envious of. Him. No, because you have one or the other. Sometimes you know, <clears throat> there is the thing of like. Your biological family, and then as Armistead Mopin says, for the LGBT community, there's your logical yeah. family. So it's just two different types of family, you mm -hmm. know, and everybody can have one. But I think the greater point is more just about after <coughs> a certain point in your life, it can be hard to make friends. Yeah. You know, it can be hard to acquire meaningful platonic friendships. And so it's, a, you know, that struggle to connect, especially in a big city like LA, is very, it, it's, it's profound. It's a big struggle. Yeah, and I think a lot of real, true friendship is people seeing you at your best and at your absolute worst and still showing up the next day. And that's what Ernesto, that's how Ernesto basically saved Sean in the yeah. film. Yeah. Is that he, you know, he's able to sit through it all. He's not a quitter. <laughs> <laughs> You, you made your uh, directorial <laughs> debut last year with the uh, yeah. Assassination Journey for Sight, a brilliant, brilliant series. Oh, thank um, you. And a brilliant episode. Thanks. Yeah, so actually, much. great point. I should have said that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for taking the compliment. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've got to work with some incredible directors, people like Shane Black, um, 
how working with John and then having to obviously make your own leap into directing, what do you take from directors? Are you kind of over his shoulder trying to learn more as you're going because it's something new or is it something No, I think, I think when I'm an actor, I'm just, it's like, how can I serve your story? You know, as a director, it's the same thing of how can I serve this story, but it's a different capacity as an actor. I think filmmaking is, in particular is a director's medium. So it's really about how can I serve your story? How can I serve you? And uh, John, it, you're just lucky when you come across someone like John who rivals any director I've ever worked with but, and who just gives you such a sense of freedom and permission as an actor and really trusts you. You know, there are a lot of risky places we had to go, really naked, mm. ugly places that we had to go on the script. And, and I think with someone who I didn't trust as much, mm. it would have been much more difficult. But because we were able to have the rehearsal process and because he is so permissive and supportive when you're working, I think that makes all the difference in the world. Do you know what's funny, though, I will say, is that actors are on set, so, like these two men, so long in their lives and and you know i've done like in the in the case of matters uh, such a huge variety of work from daytime soap to tv to feature mm -hmm. films big and small <clears throat> directors are never on set for as long <clears throat> directors have in terms of hours logged on a film set mm -hmm. they have less invariably than everybody else around mm -hmm. like all the technical yeah. crew and so on have been on sets for thousands and thousands of hours more so it's an interesting experience you know what i mean is it flows both ways you can mm -hmm. learn as a director you can learn about directing from your cameraman and from your actors and from your locations person and it all goes in, you know, as you move through it. But don't <laughs> cut yourself short. As a director, you have a much more holistic sense of everything that's going on on set. Yeah. It wasn't until I directed that I realized how much we're sheltered from as <laughs> actors. <laughs> yeah. And then I started to have real relationships with the production designer and the set decorator and, and yeah. people who you sometimes as an actor, locations manager, people who line producer, people who sometimes as an actor you may see little or know of on, on a quick shoot. Yes. That's true. I do. I do think it's great how directors are. Uh, I have to just answer so many questions, and it's great to you know somebody comes out with two t-shirts. Oh, yeah, gray, gray or blue, and you're like, well, yeah. blue, obviously. <laughs> Inside, you're going, I have no idea. You know, Coppola said something very interesting about that that helped me on Versace because I wasn't used to have being inundated with that many questions. And he said, if you can distill the theme down to one word, which hopefully you can, and maybe the script's not good enough that you can, but you yeah. can try to make it up if you can't. Thankfully on, on Versace, it was a beautiful script, so it was, it was easy to do. Yeah. It, it helps you answer even the most mundane of yes yeah. or no questions. Yeah. That's true, and Papi Chulo's blue. <laughs> yeah. Blue sky. Blue sky, blue, blue eyes. Yeah. 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 Um, the film opens the Virgin Media Film Festival. How important do you think festivals like this and things like the IFI are in getting films like Papi Chulo seen? Because, you know, every week we've got like a, a new blockbuster, a new superhero yeah. film, and you're kind of fighting for the same real estate as them. Yeah. How important is to kind of push these and, you know, you have things like Netflix as well in the background. Do you mm. see festivals being the future for that? Or I do, yeah, and I think there, it's a good point because I think it's easier than ever to get a film made and harder than ever for people to get people to see it, mm. uh, particularly to see it the way you, you would like, which is in a, in a cinema. So film festivals like this one are terrific at curating a wide uh, range of films, and the ones that I'm going to try and go see are the ones that perhaps won't find a theatrical distribution, mm. so you get to experience it in, you know, in a big room in the way that the filmmakers mm. intend. And, yeah, it's brutally hard to get your films out into the world. So I think the role of festivals gets more and more important in that regard. You know, um, the ones we've been to so far are the same, but with Dublin, you'll have the, the people of the city queuing up to see things that will never see the light of day. And I love that. Like, yeah. that's, that's what it's all about, you know. There is room in the world for the Avengers or whatever, yeah. but there's all, there also must be room for the cinematic experience of the, of the festival. And speaking of superheroes, of course, previously you've been cast as Superman and your name has popped up again recently. Is that something you'd still be interested in or is it the fact that you're playing a negative man now in Doom Patrol? Does that scratch that itch for you? Yeah, I don't know how many DC superheroes I could play. <laughs> I'm actually quite happy with Negative Man. I think it's a really interesting role and, and a, a very nuanced and, and complicated character. So I'm, I'm really happy we're collaborating with DC on that. And, you know. Who knows what the future holds. I was going to say, I know you're a father to three kids now, but that'd yeah. be cool to say, oh, Daddy Superman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. I did a, I, I played Superman in a Japanese car commercial. 
Oh, I've uh, seen a them. few years ago, <laughs> and I got to fly on the rig and everything. And our oldest was about four or five at the time, so he got to come see me fly as Superman. So, I know. Right. Why haven't I seen this? <laughs> oh, it's, it's readily available. Okay, I've got to get that. Um, you definitely looked up for it. Yeah, you, you, de- you probably need to see it. I need um, to see it. But anyway, so you know. <laughs> Whatever happens, I at least partially scratch that itch. Um, speaking of scratching that itch, I was in Galway recently, and yes. <laughs> the barman swore blind to me that you worked there. I did. In Busker Brown. Just, yeah, I, it, I hope, <laughs> I hope <laughs> the picture we put up, on, they put it up on the wall. I, I was just back mm-hmm. there back in October to visit. Yeah, I worked in Busker's and I worked in Kirby's next door mm-hmm. as well uh, when I was 21. I was convinced it was amazing. amazing. No, <laughs> the truth. And not much has changed. I love Galway. It holds a very special place. It just white collar was on in the in the background. Yeah, and he said that's how in, he said in, it because in Busker uh, Browns. In Busker Browns, they oh, the TV wow. on. Wow. I mean, world collide. That's crazy <laughs> to me. I was talking to the barman. Obviously, he came up about I doing the who I interview and all that stuff. Yeah. and he said uh, he used to work here, and I just thought he was taking the piss because wow. of what I'd said. I was like, oh, yeah. and, it goes, and it goes, no, that's here. That's where you no, used to work. I've poured many a pint in Busker Browns. <laughs> Serve many, a plate, <laughs> serve many a plate in Kirby's and Cross Street. Yeah, no, I loved it. I had an amazing experience here when I was 21 in Ireland. And to get to come back, you know, I was just, I'd done theater at the time. I was, I dreamed that maybe someday I might yeah. be in a movie. But to be able to be back here in Dublin with an Irish filmmaker, with a movie that was financed by the Irish Film Board, is just beyond surreal for me. So I'm really grateful to be here. Yeah, I called him some terrible names. Now I regret <laughs> uh, Guys, thanks very much for that best look of the film. I absolutely loved it. Cheers. Thanks thank very much. You so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>